Welcome to Your Fantastic Mind. I'm Jay Watson. This is a show where we explore the mysteries and the science of the amazing human brain. He was a typical teenage boy until he began to lose his ability to speak. His parents went from doctor to doctor and they finally got their answer. This is the story of Jeremy Obata's fight to reclaim his voice. Jeremy Obata checks for mail to understand why a walk to the mailbox <laughs> and a laugh with his mom is amazing requires us to go back through an unexpected journey and a diagnosis that has stolen the last five years of Jeremy's life. I want you to try to count to 10. One, two, three. That's about as good as you can do, huh? Or, uh... By the time then 17-year-old Jeremy arrived at Emory Brain Health, his speech okay. was all but gone, imprisoned by dystonia, a movement disorder that made his muscles contract uncontrollably. He had withered away, leaving school, becoming a recluse as his family desperately searched for answers. Close your mouth and try to hold it close. When they saw Dr. Stuart Factor, the director of the Movement Disorders Program at Emory Brain Health, they got an answer they never expected. Jeremy has a uh, rare disease. We call it uh, PANC2. The genetic degenerative brain disease that affects only three in a million people causes iron to accumulate in the brain. When you look at their MRI, it looks like two eyes. So the MRI is called the eye of the tiger. Jeremy's parents learned they each carried a single gene mutation that when put together, allowed the disease to develop in their son. It's still painful. I still wonder why. At the center of his rare odds was a young man who could no longer communicate. Dr. Factor suggested deep brain stimulation surgery, rarely used for this disease. The jury's out. Uh, very few people out there have had it done. And we reviewed the literature. There's probably 10 people in the world or 12 people in the world who've had it done. Jeremy's mom was not having it. I was afraid for him, you know, and I'm going, mm-mm, nope, nobody's going in my son's head. But Jeremy wanted it. He wanted a shot at getting his life back. There's an area of his brain, deep in his brain, called the basal ganglia that are not functioning correctly. Neurosurgeon Dr. Robert Gross performs Jeremy's surgery in an MRI scanner. We put the electrodes in, we connect them up to their own little power supply, and they fire impulses into the basal ganglia. Those impulses, which are fired at regular intervals, override the abnormal activity that's present in his basal ganglia. Three months later, questions, questions? Jeremy yeah. Yeah. is ready to talk. Yeah, I'm doing better. We saw him one month after his first programming, and I, I, you know, I couldn't believe it. I walked in the room and he said, hi, Dr. Factor. I almost came to tears because I just couldn't believe how much better he was. And I was, I was really concerned, you know, it's brain surgery and what are we doing to him? And is it gonna be worth it? And is it gonna help him? And to see him smiling and talking to me was just, I mean, that's what we do this for, right? Now count to 10 for me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Okay. There are still struggles, which require programming tweaks. Anything? Yeah. And Jeremy's speech will continue to improve. If you thought a trip to the mailbox was good, how about when a now 21-year-old man who can hold a pen again it says today is a very nice day writes out his dream in time i will have enough money possible to own your own business once again
From a rare genetic condition to something that is far more common, but no less alarming, brain aneurysms. One in 50 of us are living with unruptured aneurysms at this moment. People often refer to them as ticking time bombs. We take you inside the science and the lives of people living with them. We're gonna roll them out. Will, if you'll get a spoon, please. Cynthia Meisner, a nurse and married mom of three boys, doesn't know Patricia Artis, a colon cancer survivor and grandmother, doesn't know Juanita Alford, a wife and doting grandmother, doesn't know George Cawley. But here they are in exam rooms next to each other, strangers brought together for the same reason. Just want an answer as quick as possible. I found out what I came here to find out. <laughs> the anxiety of thinking about it now has, you know, become kind of overwhelming. Well, of course, it was very scary. It was extremely unexpected. All have been told they have or may have aneurysms. What was the manifestation of her hemorrhage? What, what, what happened? They said it was a hypertensive emergency. It was incidentally discovered during a workup for what is just probably just vertigo. The head of Emory Neurosurgery. Hello. Dr. Hi, Dan Barrow. Do do? I'm Dan Barrow. Uh, Juanita Very nice to meet it's you, nice Ms. Alford. Hello. How do you do? I'm Dan Barrow. Very nice, nice to meet you. you. Hello. Hello. How do you do? I'm good. I'm Dan Barrow. Here we are again. Good to see you again. An aneurysm is merely a weak spot on the wall of an artery that is ballooned out. No, nobody really knows why people get them. We don't really know why people get aneurysms. We know they're more common in women than men. We don't know why that is. About 15% of people that have aneurysms have a very strong family history. Tell me, in your own words, uh, what your symptoms were when you went into the emergency room with this headache. Cynthia Beisner had the worst headache of her life. Juanita Alford's aneurysm was found when she was being treated for vertigo. George Cawley's was a scan for something else. Same with Patricia Artis, whose two aneurysms were found three years ago during cancer treatment. This is the large aneurysm, uh, and this is a picture from 2015 when it was first diagnosed. And we know that it's gotten bigger now. The smaller aneurysm is here, a little more difficult to see. She has been in this exam room a half dozen times, weighing her decision. Doing nothing, I'm concerned, may be the, 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 the biggest risk because of the change that we've seen in your aneurysm. But in many cases, doing nothing, monitoring the aneurysm with regular scans, is one of three main options. And there was a day and a time when the only way you knew a patient had an aneurysm is if it ruptured and bled and they came to the hospital with a ruptured aneurysm because we didn't have the ability to do CAT scans and MRIs and CT angiography and MR angiography. Uh, and so the presumption was these must be terribly dangerous because the only time we ever see them is when they've ruptured and bled. Just because we can treat something doesn't mean we should treat it because the treatment has risks. The truth is that 50 to 80 percent of all aneurysms never rupture during the course of a person's lifetime, meaning many of us live and die with aneurysms and never know. But it's difficult to predict if or when an aneurysm will rupture. 30,000 people in the United States suffer a brain aneurysm rupture every year. For 40 percent of those people, that rupture is fatal. An aneurysm is a time bomb. It will go off. You just never know when. Do you believe that about the one in your brain? I think so. Dr. Barrow recommends that Juanita Alford get an arteriogram, a more detailed imaging test that uses x-rays and a special dye to see inside the arteries. He recommends the same thing to Cynthia Meisner. The concern I have is, is elevated somewhat because of the symptoms that you had, this sudden onset of what you describe as the worst headache of your life. Because missing a small hemorrhage from an aneurysm uh, is, is, is a no-no. Because if we miss that, um, the next hemorrhage may not, may not be a, a mild one. George Cawley is the lucky one today. I think if you're comfortable, I think getting a follow-up scan in a year 
would be a, a very good way to monitor this to be sure that nothing's changing that would make it more worrisome um, and maybe put all of our minds at, at ease. Yeah, that's what I would rather do than doing anything invasive or anything right now. I would agree with you. Yeah. The other options for treating aneurysm are surgery and endovascular coiling. Surgery is where an opening is made in the skull. Under an operating microscope, a small clip is placed across the base or neck of the aneurysm to block the normal blood flow from entering. The clips remain permanently. The other option, endovascular coiling, is where a catheter is placed in the femoral artery in the groin, then guided up into the artery containing the aneurysm. A microcatheter goes into the aneurysm through which coils made of soft platinum metal are released. The coils prevent blood from getting into the aneurysm. They remain permanently as well. For Patricia Artis, it's time. She chooses surgery. I don't want to keep living day to day with that anxiety. The one promise I can make is it will take really good care of you. I'm dependent on that. <laughs> This is at the time of surgery. The smaller anterior communicating artery is being exposed. The blue arrows point to the optic nerves, the yellow to the carotid artery, the green to the anterior cerebral artery, and the red to the aneurysm. Now the clip is being placed on the anterior communicating artery aneurysm and slowly closed. That clip now has eliminated the aneurysm from the normal circulation. A pair of micro scissors is used to open the aneurysm to be sure that it is completely clipped and that no blood is getting into it from the circulation. It's a philodendron in there. It's almost unbelievable how good I was from the surgery. Four months later, Artis is living her life, thinking of other things besides her now gone aneurysm. Life is really good. Excellent. Absolutely excellent. Juanita Alford needed time to think, but it was a conversation with her seven-year-old grandson that moved her forward. He said, Nana, are you going to die? Which totally shocked me. <laughs> And I said, well, sure, honey, we all have to die, but Nana's not planning to die soon. And uh, he said, well, I just want you to know, Nana, when you die, I will miss you. He said, but um, you will be able to see me. Her arteriogram showed three aneurysms two only treatable by surgery and not suitable for coiling. She's deciding whether or not to proceed with coiling of the largest one and monitor the smaller ones. I go to bed every night praying that I'll make it through the night. And I wake up in the morning thanking God that I did. Uh, I think there's only 10 coming today. Okay, set the timer now for about 12 minutes. Cynthia Meisner's arteriogram showed an aneurysm. She chose surgery. During surgery, Dr. Barrow discovered her aneurysm indeed had bled at the time she experienced that severe headache that led to its discovery. He called George and he said, it is a miracle. And he said, it is so good she decided to do this. There are things we cannot predict, decisions that are hard to make. All carry risk, but also reward. So we've got plans to travel and do some things, and the thought of not being able to spend time with my family just was really an eye-opener. Checking that you lock the door, making sure the stove is off, washing your hands a lot, being very neat. People joke about obsessing over these things, but the truth of the actual condition, obsessive compulsive disorder, is nothing like this. It can be debilitating and life altering, but as you're about to see, there is hope. I think a lot of it was in hindsight. It's only in looking back that Andrea Martin can see the truth one that began to take shape when she was young. I would go back and 
reread things a lot because I'd be afraid that I missed something. And then it just kept getting worse, like in college and like in my mid to late 20s was when it just started getting like what I felt kind of out of control. You know, I was very worried about things like security in my home. I was checking the locks all the time. I wasn't driving. It was uncomfortable because if I didn't wear the right clothing, I would be thinking about it all day long. Dave Saunders' intrusive thoughts drastically impacted the direction of his life. I went to med school and I dropped out and I had started having these weird showering rituals. Um, you know, I started taking long showers in the morning um, and feeling like it was hard to get out of the shower. Martin and Saunders have obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, an often misunderstood disorder thought to be a need for neatness or order or hand washing. It is sometimes portrayed as a personality quirk a misconception that is harmful for people who really do have OCD, making it harder to be taken seriously or to get help. And if you are washing your hands, it's a little bit lucky because you'll get referred right away for the proper treatment. If your OCD isn't involving, you know, symmetry, arranging, checking, or some of those things that come to mind, then people wait years. The average is between 7 and 12 years between onset of symptoms and accessing effective treatment. Emory psychologist and OCD specialist Dr. Jordan Caddy says OCD can be debilitating and life-limiting and that those with it are plagued by unwanted, intrusive, even frightening or violent thoughts they cannot shake. That's the obsession part. The thoughts are so disturbing and upsetting that people feel driven to do something repetitively to alleviate the feeling. That's the compulsion. Folks will notice that they have to do things in a certain way. I have to drive a certain way. I have to check this many times. I have to feel like my hands are clean before I walk away from the sink and turn it off. Compulsions can be invisible to others, such as avoiding something, replacing a negative thought with a positive thought, or saying certain words in your head. While all of us have intrusive thoughts every day, OCD involves paying a lot of attention to them, fearing that the thoughts are important or harmful, and needing to do something to make the thoughts or anxiety go away. This interferes with a person's daily life. If you really, truly have OCD, like doing those things can be maddening because it's like, like I'm never clean enough. It's never organized enough. It's never, I'm never safe enough. Um, I've always gotten a lot of intrusive thoughts about just really bad things happening. In Martin's so case, might... intrusive, fearful thoughts about driving led her to give it up. I just kept having these images of getting in a horrible accident and like being in pain and like dying on the side of the road or you know, all these kinds of things are like, um, sometimes it might have been about accidentally hurting someone else. Martin also did something sometimes associated with OCD. Uh, she picked at her 30. skin. At one time I picked at my chin so bad that I just, it was like, it was basically like a scab like all over my chin. And hair. I would kind of like just like go like this, like scratch and just like rub at my scalp. And then the more and more I did it, it would end up breaking the hairs off. Um, I was doing it so badly that I had like little spots in my part that were literally like missing hair. Like they looked like tiny little bald spots. Hi, are you on your way? On this day, Dave's having a hard time getting to his appointment with Dr. Caddy. She takes a few phone calls in a 15 minute period. Well, that makes sense. Cause you're kind of doing something different than what your thoughts are recommending to you. He arrives. Hey, Dr. Caddy. Hi, how uh, are you? I'm well, how are you? I'm well, thanks. Come Good. on in. Good. So you mentioned getting here was a little bit of a difficult experience. What was the trigger that you, knew, that you noticed? Um, I don't know, I guess just having my intrusive thoughts. When the thoughts came in, what were they about? Um, like, like causing harm to myself or, you know, somebody else. And so what and like, discomfort did you have to have today? When you started feeling uncomfortable having these intrusive thoughts, what did your OCD want you to do? Um, kind of, kind of avoid. 
This is how OCD can turn a seemingly simple thing, a trip to the doctor, into an impossible task. According to the NIH, over 2 million people in the U.S. have a diagnosed form of OCD. But keep in mind, it's very underdiagnosed. Up to 80% of people with severe OCD also have depression. It took Saunders and Martin years to get diagnosed. Both did ERP, exposure therapy with response prevention, shown to be effective in treating OCD. ERP, or exposure therapy, involves approaching the feared stimulus really gradually and systematically in a doable, may, in a doable way so that safety learning can take place in the brain. Patients face no their fears and gradually break relationship. that connection between okay, the thanks. thoughts and the so, action um, that follows it. Yeah, Only learning to operate without rituals can break the cycle of OCD. There are some specific circuits that are um, connected differently or that are communicating differently in brains that have OCD and brains that don't. Research has shown OCD can run in families and involves abnormal fear processing and problems in communication between the front part of the brain and deeper structures of the brain, such as the basal ganglia. Brains of people with OCD behave differently in specific ways. They pay more attention to certain fear triggers and they have trouble tolerating uncertainty and they tend to overestimate how dangerous the situation may be. Brains with OCD also learn differently. Because of differences in reward processing, they have trouble choosing long-term benefits over short-term relief of anxiety. Safety learning is also impaired, which means high levels of anxiety and fear persist until the person gains enough practice without rituals for safety learning to take place in the brain. In some people, the brain circuits involved in OCD become more normal with either medications that affect serotonin levels or cognitive behavior therapy, like ERP. With affirmations stuck to his walls, Dave does as he has written. He keeps going. Andrea is driving, working, in a long-term relationship. Things that once seemed impossible are now part of a fulfilling life one that will always present challenges. I just don't want anybody to ever feel like they have to do it alone or that there isn't any hope because things can definitely get a lot better and it's never going to go away, but you can get to a place where you can manage it. Andrea Martin and Dave Saunders are now advocates in the OCD community. The International OCD Foundation is just one place where you can find resources and help. That's going to do it for us this week. See you next time on Your Fantastic Mind.